This podcast is part of the Game and Entertainment Network. Visit tgenetwork.net to find the latest episodes from all our shows. It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 179. Tonight I'm joined by Ashgar. Hello. Grace. Hello. Tam. Hello. And Thalen. Hi there. We are down to Koja this week, but I think he will be back for next week's show? Question mark? I don't know. He's not here to say anything. <laughs> uh, so so last week we uh, recorded a super serious podcast and... Uh, it seems to have gotten like some traction out in the community, <laughs> or at least was linked by a bunch of people. So that's a thing. Um, I kind of want to start off with a weird offshoot topic. Mostly that in on the internet, the people that you hear are oftentimes a very vocal minority of the actual gamers that are out there in the world. This week with the launch of Destiny, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few, um, there was a quote-unquote epidemic of banning where people would log <laughs> where people would log into the game and they did nothing wrong and were instantly banned and this Thousands this was picked up millions this millions was picked up by Everyone. every news outlet for gaming like and it was a major point of like what the hell is Bungie doing um and okay so me me being a longtime IT employee when I hear this thing, I immediately am skeptical because users I lie. I promise I didn't do anything. A lot. Yeah. Users lie. It just lie. broke all on its own. I didn't push the button. I didn't delete all the records. Like, this is a thing. <laughs> this is epidemic. Users will lie straight to your face. So when I hear someone say, I got banned for nothing, I have had too much experience watching some community manager later on quell the fire by calling out the guy and you know specifically stating what he did wrong that was heinous so this lasted like a day and a half uh because Bungie didn't really make much of a statement there were basically two unofficial or one official statement and another unofficial statement basically saying that their their system won't auto ban anyone and what started this controversy is they they've done a lot in destiny 2 to stop code injection but this also breaks a lot of screenshot tools and that's a whole other I discussion take screenshots of this game and i'm mad about it i figured out workarounds but i mean <laughs> i had to do i had to do a workaround to take screenshots and they all show up in a folder called desktop in my game screenshots folder because i'm basically taking a screenshot of my desktop with a game overlaying it but anyway um so so that on top of the supposed banning epidemic like was a fever pitch on launch day. And my first thing was like, I kept asking people that were, that were forwarding this story. Like, do you know anyone who's actually been banned? And no one could really step forward and say, yes, I know someone who was banned. It was always a, a friend of a friend got banned. So on day two, they posted some actual information. There were 400 account bans. of those four were overturned because when they reviewed them again, they decided they were maybe a little too gun shy. Four wrongful bans, four hundred total bans. So it's like not this epidemic in the in the total number of copies of people playing. That's nothing, and they were all done by hand. They all were done in a situation where someone reviewed them. But like this, this was just one of those 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 situations where it is a handful of people that caused this mass panic. And so often that's the case in gaming. Like a couple people will start a riot over things. Um, another case, like this dire directly relates to the topic we talked about last week, is like there's widespread panic over loot boxes. Well, the numbers are now in on some of those games that launched with that are single player games with loot boxes in them, and it doesn't seem to have done anything to hurt their sale. So once again, like the panic maybe wasn't there wasn't wasn't as as it should have been 
it just like it's it's weird to me that a a very few number of people can so heavily skew the ancestral knowledge of gamers of what's really going on yeah well, i mean it's it's the thing you always see that you know people who are happy with how things are going with, with what they have don't say anything because they're happy so they don't you know they don't need to say anything it's the people who are unhappy that complain and so that's who you see and so you know people think that everybody's unhappy which is frustrating because i you know honestly like you back to the whole mass effect andromeda thing there were probably a lot of people that happily played that game just like i did but it's the people that really didn't enjoy it that you know killed the prospect of a lot of people ever buying it and i don't know how you can combat that like i doubt we're ever going to get people to you know make regular posts of everything's fine like just as a gamer oh yeah i am i'm effectively satisfied with this game well in andromeda's case its problem is that you don't get a second chance to make a first impression right yeah and it launched in a not great state no i mean well, the thing about the the destiny bands is that the game itself is doing just fine and the whole ban nonsense will blow over and the state of the game is pretty good so yeah i think it it won't be a long term issue yeah, yeah, I mean, the majority of people who decide, who wanted to play the game are happily playing the game, and yeah. But for that first day, there were a lot of people petrified of running Discord or running OBS or running, like, anything else and Destiny at the same time. And it was just sad. Like, I, I did all of these things, and it worked fine for me. But I am one person saying, no, everything is fine against a bunch of people re-forwarding the same stories. <laughs> Um, like maybe this is a decent transition point, but as far as a launch goes, Destiny 2 was pretty smooth. Like at least the PC launch. Yeah. Like the clan roster is still broken, but other than yeah, that, I, you know. <laughs> and I don't know what was up with that because the same problem hit the PS4 launch. Yeah. And actually, it was roughly a week. Functionality other than that, like we're successfully earning XP for our clan and our clan is now level two. So, I mean... And in theory, if, Everything else if, works. if more people get their 5,000, we may be able to hit rank 3 this week. I don't know. Mm, we need a few more people still, but maybe. I mean, like, like maybe mathematically, mathematically, it's possible within the amount of... We haven't capped for yes. the week in Clan XP. We Look, not. we're not all, all you, Bell. We're not all going to level 3 characters and cap out their XP for the week. <laughs> the I, first I'm, week. I may or may not have two capped and we'll probably have the third capped tomorrow but anyway I mean I might do this thing but not everyone will do this thing <laughs> I mean I'm more likely to do it here than in the original Destiny because at no point in the story do you get blocked by a mission that requires a group right so that's a plus but yeah I, mean, like, it, it was I still weird need to earn power strikes... from my main <laughs> It was weird that strikes didn't unlock until the end of the story, roughly. But, by the same token, like, it is nice that you're not capped early on by go do a strike. Um, I'm still amazed at how well it runs on my slightly older gaming laptop. Like, it is not perfect by any means, but, like, it looks essentially as good as my PS4. Yeah, it's been super smooth for me, apart from, like, today... After I had been on Io, which is the Flashpoint planet, for a few hours, it started, like, getting a little slow and then crashed. Ah. Uh, yeah, I've run into But a then when I logged back leak. in, it was fine, so. Yeah, I ran into a similar, like, memory leak. I don't know what caused it. Yeah. Where just, like, my performance degraded for a while, which I thought was related to me having, like, 70 open Warframe streams, but it just... <laughs> It just helped. I mean, I I didn't have to close the, when I closed those. It didn't get any better. But when I restarted the program, it was fine. Any Warframe streams. It was all fine. <laughs> yes. Yes. War, War, Warframe has a thing going right now where yeah. if you watch a Twitch Aww. streamer playing Warframe, every time they earn an achievement, you get an you get an item. And yeah, it's nonsense. They, they you can multi Twitch this. Well, you can't anymore. They 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 made some changes. Um, 
up originally, yeah, you could get as many streams as you could up at once, and they all counted, and people were earning like hundreds or thousands of items in the course well, of, of a few hours. And even more so than that, like there were streamers that specialized in deleting their characters and creating a brand new character so you oh, got yeah. an influx of a lot of achievements real fast and then yep. deleting it again and creating a brand new account the yep. intent was that streamers would go to the new planes areas no. where they add a whole bunch of achievements because they probably already had most of the achievements look, in the original game look that's so it's a lovely idea <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let, let let me tell you a story about the first faction rally and why I don't think it will be this way when the faction rally comes back around is the intent of faction rally was to get you to go do public events and strikes together. But there were explodable boxes that appeared in sector or lost sectors. And there were like five boxes in some of them. And quickly, the fastest farm route was to run into a lost sector, kill the five boxes, die, respawn at the door, kill the five boxes, die, respawn at the door, <laughs> kill the five boxes, die. <laughs> so, like, you know, people rack up like 700 tokens. I mean, I won't lie. I did some of that myself. That's why I had every single faction over 30. And I have a feeling that the next time it won't be that easy. I mean, we, sh we should all be fully aware by now that gamers will optimize the fun out of anything and everything if given especially a especially when it comes to farming <laughs> we need to have to talk about the loot cave yeah i mean people will always find a way to put bring back a loot cave and the thing is is like the famous loot cave has been gone for a long long time it but doesn't every matter time, <laughs> every time they've tweaked something in the game a new loot cave has shown up that they then yeah. have to quell like, there's been lots of versions of the loot cave. One of the things that you pick up when in game development for more than a little bit is your players will... Your players are going to be better at the game than anybody in your office ever could be. Like, they just are. They're going to find all of the things that you'll never even think of. Well, and beyond that, there's just so many more of them that, you know... Working as like, a group, they will twenty find developers the most can't thing. think. Yeah, twenty developers can't outthink. You know, one point five million players. Yeah, it's it's just one point five million of players that are working in tandem with each other on discords and forums and reddits to try and yeah. figure out how to exploit your game. Even more efficient than multiple typewriters. Apparently, like there are prestige uh, lost sectors now, prestige. and that's something. That, Something was found out, yeah. So, like, apparently you have to zone in to a nightfall, and then instead of completing the nightfall, wander off in another direction. Like, zone out of the nightfall onto the planet and go find a lost sector, and you'll get, like, a much harder boss version of the lost sector. You have to do this within, like, the time limit of the nightfall? Yes. Yes, you do. What? Though, to That's be fair, really... like, this week... Yeah, you know, we did the nightfall. <laughs> like, one shot at the nightfall. So I heard. <laughs> it was kind of nonsense, but... <laughs> it was fun nonsense. I'm sad I missed that nonsense. It sounded like fun. Yeah. It was a good time. Yeah, I'm definitely willing to, to do the nightfall again for anybody, but... I don't think repeat doing it will get any rewards. Like, for the players that have already done it, but... Whatever. I don't I, know if I'd do it again. Yeah, I'd totally do it again. It was silly. Yes, silly is a good word for it. Super fun, though. Grenade all the things. I'm just happy because like, this is the first time that I've ever been able to podcast and play Destiny at the same time. <laughs> like, this is, a, this is a life goal for me. <laughs> like, I've wanted to play Destiny while we podcast, but no, I can't talk and, you know, control her at the same time. Because my little button scheme never really worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Like the, the the listeners won't understand that madness, but no, I did some madness trying to figure out a way to have a reasonable push to talk button on my controller. This involved a selfie selfie Bluetooth button. Yes, that I then affixed to the bottom of my controller, and that sort of worked, but not really. It didn't really work. I mean, it would have worked if it had held it down. Like it it auto released after a period of time, so. It clipped to the back end of whatever the hell I was saying. I've been sort of surprised that there isn't a decent foot pedal. 
other than the the ones that are designed for like uh transcriptionists no like those don't exist i feel like that's something that like logitech or a real device manufacturer needs to solve instead of some weird you know third party knockoff thingy that you find in the back of alibaba so we had a whole list of things that we were going to talk about last week but then the other topic dominated the entire show one of which was warhammer shades fire i don't even think that was a topic from last week i think it was just a new topic for this i'm week. pretty sure it was a topic from last week but i don't remember what the topics from last week were so i mean we didn't play it until this past week it's true it is a topic in any case yes <laughs> They're words, okay? They're words that go in a sequence. Anyway, uh, so I've anybody who's been listening to the show for more than a little bit has heard me like fairly with with some amount of surprise talk about how Games Workshop is getting its act together as far as a lot of things go. And one of the things that it's done is as a company, they have funded and staffed their specialist games division back into something that is putting out content and like making new games and games workshop has usually had some pretty good specialist games necromunda was fun yeah like necromunda was good and they, they've had quite a or few no. blood bowl and they've been Man. really good about supporting blood bowl uh i think that it i don't think it's as well supported as guild ball which is its direct competitor but but it's really you know, it's it's been pretty well supported. And so they just recently came out with Shadespire, which is their equivalent of a skirmish size fantasy game. But it's all played so it's all played on hexes with a deck building aspect. So it's like skirmish sized minis deck building with fantasy flight dice. And um one of the things that one of the things that I thought was really neat about it is it just I like the idea of that kind of scale on a hex grid. But uh, when I picked it up and found and like read through the rules, I noticed that there was a like explicit support for more than two players, uh, which I don't see often enough in minis games, like just a, a good scalable way of adding players. I mean, really, Necromunda and Mordheim are the only two that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, and I've seen games like kind of make it make it work, but it's not usually great. Um, but so the first game of Shadespire we played was a three person game and it worked really well. Like I was legitimately surprised at how well it worked. Um, it's a quick game. It's fairly fast. Once you, once you know what you're doing, there are only three rounds total. You only get four actions per player per round. Yeah. But you might not end up going that long because it's also fairly lethal and army sizes are small. The box comes with the Stormcast Eternals and Corn Berserkers, and the Stormcast have three units, and the Berserkers have five. Yeah, so it's like, all right, with these eight models, you're going to play a game, but you get a you get a pretty good game out of it. And despite the vast differences in uh, in size, the it works out really well. Like the the two sides seemed pretty balanced. Uh, it was sort of an interesting thing, because the the corn guys they're more numerous but but individually weaker um whereas like the quality of the stormcast guys is much higher just on a on a like stat line basis but they are slow but they're slow and you don't get to move very much like moving is an action and each each model can only move once per round so like if you look at if you're if you look at your your possible maximum, you're talking about nine total nine total hexes any given character can move over the course of the game, more or less. For the for the like paladin stormcast eternal guys. Uh whereas the corn they moves up like five or something ridiculous. They all start four and once three units of any kind die, they start moving at five. Yeah. So they become really fast. Um but the what I find really interesting, they took an idea that I've really enjoyed about 40k, about the like the current edition of 40k, and incorporated into the game where you have one of your decks is an objective deck, which is you they are the they are what scores you points, and whoever has the most points at the end wins. And they're they're all kinds of stuff. They're 
hold a particular numbered objective of which there are a bunch on the board depending on how many players you have there's things like score this if you killed two different enemy models this turn score this if no more enemy models are on the board score this at the <laughs> end of the score this in the end of the game if nobody's in your in your tur- in your uh area cuz each uh, each player deploy each player puts down like a board that clicks or not really clicks but fits together with other boards uh and that's your ter- territory and if nobody's in your territory you can score some points at the end of the game stuff like that but there but because it's a deck and you can only have 3 of these cards in your hand at any given time your you only score them if you draw you only score one of them if you you only draw new ones if you score one or you can spend an action to discard one and draw a new one but it means that like what you're trying to do throughout the game is changing every round which i think is really cool and you have ways of it costs you precious actions but that can make a huge difference if you get rid of a, a objective that you just weren't going to score it's not sitting and wasting time in your hand okay so question about how much does it cost to get set up with this thing sixty dollars that's it sixty dollars <laughs> right that, that seems unreasonably you know cheap for a yeah games for workshop, games workshop. yeah sixty dollars sixty dollars gets you the entire core set which is the three stormcast eternals five corn dudes uh decks for both of them a f- initial set of neutral cards so you can do deck building tokens and two territory boards like it's everything two people need to get started so are they selling these in like specific army packs or is that all that's out right now that's all that's out it just came out like it's it was brand new as of last week i think a little like before it, that but not much before that yeah the next armies are Undead and Orcs, which both come out next week, and they're being sold in packs, basically. That's cool. That was one of the problems with, like, both Necromunda and uh, Mordheim was they were just, like, single sprue mo- or uh, miniatures, so you kind of had to know exactly what you needed before you even went to the shop. Yeah. They in this to... case, there's not a whole lot of, well, there, as far as I can tell, no actual list building. If you bring... Uh, you're bringing the Reavers, you're bringing these five dudes. Yeah. See, I like, I know there are people that like, you know, building army lists, but I think it's way more approachable when you have a bunch of fixed comps. A hundred percent agree. Like, you are this, or you are this, or you are this. This is your team, or this is your team, or this is your team. And, like, I, I am the person who likes building army lists, <laughs> but in this particular case, like, it works super well. What you the the customization part is deck building if you want to get into that. But even that, like, mm, if you want, or just use what they give you. But it was it was a really fun game. Like we played the three of us, and we had a couple of we had a couple of really like I think two of us got really good turns and pulled pulled pretty far ahead. Like I had a really really strong first round, and then painted a big target on myself and got pummeled immediately afterward. But despite that, I was I'd gotten enough of a lead that I could that I was still sort of relevant in the game until the very end. Um, you did manage to win by like one point, right? No, I lost by one point. Ah. I was in second. I got close though. But yeah, I, I liked it a lot. Would definitely play it again. Looking About how long to... does it take to uh, to run a, a match? So it took the three of us like what an hour and a half or so, maybe a little longer. Something like that. But like that it was would not with take us... that long next time. It would, yeah, it would not take that long next time. This was with us, with this was with us reading the rules as we played. I mostly asked because, like, I'm constantly looking for potential gaming options for lunch. You could totally get a game of this in over lunch. I mean, maybe not a four, maybe not a three or four player game, unless you were really quick about it, but like a two player game, yeah, you could totally get that in over lunch. Yeah, because like Dice Throne, for example, I am really thinking is a good fit for that, other than like. Some of the crazy long games that we played at Pack South. Yeah. Like, I think once once somebody gets used to that game, it's not going to take as long as, like, some of the matches did. Or we may just have to ban the Rogue in Dice Throne. Because it se- <laughs> seemed to take forever. The Rogue is out, but is also good at not taking it. And, until, of course, he, you know, if he hits his ult, he no longer kills slowly. 
Right, but like that that one is playing a totally different game where they're trying to draw out things. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly for for 60 bucks, which is less than most board games, honestly. Uh it was pretty it was pretty easy to pick up and it was I consider that totally worth it. You need two sets if you're going to play with more than two people because you need the boards. You basically add a board mm. for every person beyond the first. But like the objectives and and the ability cards have like if you have three people this is what you need to do if you have four people this is what you need to do so the the scaling is built into the cards well that's cool which is nice um and like super quality push fit minis i mean not that it's not that that's surprising games workshop kind of has the market cornered on quality plastic sculpts but minus minus one mini that does not go together <laughs> in a sensible way uh they all go together pretty well and then once they're together they like I, I have I assembled all of them without any glue and I'm not the slightest bit worried about whether or not they're gonna fall apart or something. I might glue the shoulder of that one just so it stays together. Yeah. Yeah, she has a weird arm shoulder connection thing going. And her huge shield. I have to say that oh. that shield didn't do me any good. <laughs> it's fair. Also makes me wonder if they're gonna turn around and do a forty K variant as they well. They are in fact they already I mean, are. Yeah, they're doing Necromunda. Necromunda. Yeah, they're re releasing well, cool. Necromunda. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like compared to Shadespire, but they've they've already sort of showed off some of it. They're I very, feel like, like they're going to have to scale it down massively because like Necromunda had vehicles as well. Yeah, I, I, I think that goes against the flavor of what they're trying to do with Shadespire. Yeah, but Mordheim never had any like siege weaponry or anything. No, no, it's just like war bands of like five to eight people usually. Yeah, and that's pretty much exactly what Shadespire is. User disconnected from your channel. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know what Necromunda is going to look like, but I'll be honest, I, I was not really interested in Necromunda because I don't really go into the like, I don't get heavily into the early '90s punk <laughs> cyberpunk. <laughs> look that games workshop loves to theme necromunda with the like gangs cyberpunk gangs everyone has a mohawk you know basically only soccer of these and... models have mohawks the rest have top knots oh yeah i mean they're basically soccer hooligans with you know sci-fi guns yeah but then when you're not playing orcs <laughs> um but i i might i don't think i'm, I'm gonna just pick up necromunda but i'm definitely gonna i'm definitely interested in looking into it and i'm almost certainly going to pick up uh more shadespire stuff although i really wish they would release a more me faction i'm not sure what the you faction in fantasy is elves they would be elves <laughs> i feel like there's yeah i feel like or i would as a secondary it might be like, dark elves like elves dark elves human wizards like schools of magic dudes or uh i would i would actually be really into their techno dwarves they're like the dwarves that are more about uh building stuff than holding grudges because they're releasing the dwarves that are all like they all have red hair Mohawk with dwarves. mohawks and axes and no shirts. troll slayers yeah Sliders. yeah they're doing that they're doing that group but they're not doing the like we're in heavy armor with exquisitely designed weapons. We have airships and look like we walked out of 40k. So yeah. not the hearth guard type. Yeah, not the hearth guard type. I mean even if it weren't even if it weren't like necessarily the new fantasy dwarves which are amazing looking but also yes look like they walked out of 40k. Uh even just like the more industrious and less berserkery dwarves would be would be in my wheelhouse. But yes, really it's elves, dark elves or wizard colleges i feel like if they did wizard colleges they'd basically do a single college per war band maybe i mean i could also just see them do college of magic where you get you know one one wizard of each type and that way they all have like they all feel different but yeah i mean currently your current options are paladins uh paladins berserkers dwarf berserkers uh skaven skeletons and orcs. I don't think I missed one. I think that's all of them. I mean, I like Skaven. Ones. Yeah, that's all of the announced ones. There are definitely some that I know people are very excited about. It's just I'm not super excited about any of them. I also like Lizardmen quite a bit. Yeah, that's what I would go for if they exist somehow. I mean, like, maybe they like money. 
they do like money. If it does like, well, they will probably continue expanding it. Everything I have heard about that is like people talking about how good it is. So I feel like it's going to do well. It's it, but, it, it's really good. It is really back, good, but people also do need to buy it. Yes, yeah. people do need to buy it. Although, I have to say, uh, Corvus Belly, the Infinity company. Oh. So Infinity, in its in its background, has this thing called Aristeo, which is an arena combat like game show that they talk about and is referenced periodically. And like every so often, a unit in the game is like got their start as an Aristea combatant. So they recently isn't that kind of like the Smash TV thing? Yeah, kind of. Okay. So they basically just announced slash are coming out with Aristea, the board game, which is a hex based game using in set in the infinity universe that's an arena combat skirmish game and i feel like this was not the right time to release that considering that shadespire and necromunda are almost certainly just going to eat their lunch i feel really bad for them because they announced before shadespire and are releasing after it games workshop has been kind of fast on this whole thing lately that's probably a good thing for games workshop but it's less of a good thing for corvus belly yep no i mean like and I feel like, I don't know, like maybe maybe it's just this market, but, you know, Infinity doesn't have much traction in, in like my area other than a single game store. Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of, tra- I mean, it's competing against giants, but yeah, it doesn't have a ton of traction, comparatively speaking, which is why, like, I think a spinoff game like that is not a great idea. But whatever, excuse for them to make one-off minis that they like, I suppose. Um, they made a panda for some reason. I'm not sure why they made a panda. But it's sort of, it's it's interesting as well, uh, or at least I find it interesting as well, that, so last week, I think it was last Friday, Games Workshop drops Shadespire. Uh, this this Friday, Codex Craft Worlds dropped. So like that just came out and I've been flipping through that this weekend. Next week, the next release of Shadespire comes out and I'm pretty sure the Tyranids Codex goes on pre-order. And like early November, Tyranids pre Ty- Tyranids Codex, and they have I think two or three more codexes that they're going to release before the end of the year. Like they're, I mean, really... to some extent, this all makes sense because like they spent a lot of time in recent years tooling up their plastic production, and they probably have it down to an artwork at this point. Probably, and like not everything is. A lot of the codexes aren't getting new minis, but in a lot of cases, that's fine. What they've needed is to get the rules out so that people are playing on a level playing field. And they're doing a really good job with that so far. Like, if your army has a... Everybody got an update at the exact same time to bring them into this this edition. And if you have a codex, you're probably a little ahead in terms of power. And, like, if you're playing a strong army that also has a codex you're probably going to be pretty... You're probably going to have a, like a noticeable advantage over somebody whose army hasn't had a codex and wasn't ahead of the power curve. But but they're moving quick on getting those out. Actually get them all out for all armies before the next edition hits. Yeah, right? I mean, they're really saying... Really, before the middle of next year. Yeah, they're, they're saying that they will have a codex for every army. Like, every every army that has a codex, they will have a codex out by summer 2018 madness and like yeah right and that this year's focus is imperium and next year's focus is xenos so like expect expect despite that the elf craft worlds codex just craft worlds codex just came out yeah yeah yeah. it's like despite that craft worlds dropped and tyranids are going to drop before the end of this year and the the scuttlebutt about the tyranids codex is it is a doozy whereas the imperial codexes so for the most part like, the Space Marines Codex was a Space Marines Codex. It was whatever. It's about what you expect. Space Marines got cool stuff. Um, but, like, Chaos is a pretty good Codex. Death Guard is considered amazing. It's also new. Nice. Um, like, but Death Guard is amazing. Uh, Adeptus, or Grey Knights, is, Grey Knights are whatever, okay. They're not, nobody's thrilled by them, but they're not terrible. Um, okay, so so correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Adeptus Mechanicus or Grey Knights have ever had their own codex. They got them at the very tail end of last edition. I think they like, were the those last are at least ones codex. I do not remember getting codexes. Yeah, 
they've got codexes now which like uh for those two having an having a codex at all is kind of exciting i would guess when the nids come out they're going to have a separate nids and a separate gene stealer cults i think they're doing a separate gene stealer cults yeah but like they almost don't need to because imperial guard's already out imperial guard is imperial guard right is what people are considering the gold standard for codexes at the moment like guard got a really amazing codex like a codex that's so good that they had to nerf it really hard <laughs> within a couple of weeks of it coming out. Oops. But it was like, they nerfed it super hard, and it broke one really degenerate build, and there's still like 30, 30 or more really compelling other builds that you can still go with. Just maybe don't go with the conscripts one. Yeah, maybe just don't, maybe just don't bring 500 conscripts to, your, to the table. Anyway, I say all of that to say... I'm, I've been pretty impressed with Games Workshop's new management. That does not always mean, like, under new management is not always a good sign. But in this case, it really seems to be them trying to do right by their players at a time when their major competition is doing the opposite thing. Yeah, I'm happy to see Warhammer as a whole doing okay. I mean, it was kind of one of those things that I sort of begrudgingly loved because of, you know, fond memories from the past but it sounds like it's in a good place now or at least yeah. getting to a good place yeah well and there and and in a similar vein like their writing is a little bit more obviously satire in the places where it's just ridiculous and otherwise they've kind of at least in the at least from what i've read in the codexes they've kind of toned down the nonsense i mean there's no orc codex yet right there's no there is no orc <laughs> codex yet that's true that 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 is where the nonsense traditionally lives well but it's also not like it's not as aggressively like it doesn't take itself quite super seriously um except in the space marines codex Could, yeah but like the id yeah. codex is definitely the doing the other thing yeah good the ID, yeah the the imperial guard codex is it's very clearly written in the same style as the space marine codex but it's having a lot of jokes about it that are not subtle. Like, I mean, Imperial, Imperial Guard is the ODST to, you know, Halo. Yeah. They're, they're worse than that. Like, yeah, they're, they're not that that's great. Not, that's giving them entirely too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they are a bunch of very sad, normal humans in a world where normal humans just, just, just don't measure up. Yeah. On the bright side, they have all the tanks. They do. And those <laughs> tanks are good now. They made the tanks good. Like, I don't play any tanks, but, but their tanks are really good. Um, and, like, I mean, I, I realize it's not the hugest shocker that I'm an Eldar player, but but I'm flipping through the Eldar Codex. I'm really happy with it. It doesn't do a lot, but it does make virtually everything I might w be interested in taking worth taking. I don't, I don't think there is a single unit in that whole Codex that I can't envision someone saying, yep, I want to I take that in my list. Maybe striking scorpions aren't very good. Like I feel like I will always take chain swords if given the option. Oh man, not not, not, not chain axes. No chain swords because it <laughs> makes my little my my inner twelve year old very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have any chain swords in my army in anything I play because the well, you, yeah you yeah. don't have space marines so yeah that's well uh, I have actually true I have space marines well you I have, have primaris yeah oh and they don't. The Primera stuff doesn't have chain swords. Yeah, see, I always went uh, jump pack troops with chain swords. I mean, that's definitely a thing that is coming. Blood Angels have not uh, come out yet. Although there's some, there's a lot of speculation as to what the remaining codexes are. But then again, nobody guessed Tyranids, so who knows at this point? Like there was a rumor, there was a rumor that. Tyranids was going to be a codex before the end of the year, and everyone dismissed it with a laugh, like, haha, that's a great joke. Seriously, what codexes do you think are gonna happen? And then they announced it, and people were like, Well, I give up on trying to understand anything anymore. I don't know if the Nids have had a major rework in a really long time. Like they they've kind of had a fairly static army list. Yeah. But like the the Nids have not had a had a relevant codex in like in quite in almost as long as orcs and the fact that 
the fact that uh, playtesters are apparently reporting the Tyranid Codex as meta changing is making a whole lot of like diehard Tyranid players so happy. That's interesting. The fact that the fact that people would even would even like the that they're even hearing any rumors about the Tyranid Codex is just exciting. <laughs> So it's kind of neat to see. And it's kind of it's been kind of fun like riding the wave of people being really excited about this game. Like I hang out on the shockingly positive 40k subreddit and I probably every day there's a post that's like, "Hey, I haven't played this game in 10 years, 15 years, 25 years." <laughs> and just came back to it because i found these you know i found these old minis in my closet and and then people get really excited because they're like oh wow those are old like first edition rogue trader things like those are super cool and and you can tell that there's a certain amount of surprise from people that are like oh wow huh it's kind of cool having like this piece of history for this game that's still relevant and i can still use it the that community really loves its classic minis but there's also, Man. like, I've looked at this game for 20 years and never picked it up, but I just picked it up now because people have been saying good stuff about it. I tell you, the company that really needs to look at this and, you know, maybe pattern themselves after it is Wizards of the Coast with Magic the Gathering because it does a really bad job of onboarding players. Wizards would really, really like you to get started with Standard. But even then, like, there is, there's no product I can buy in hand to someone that is going to get them ready to play standard. It's true. Like that doesn't exist. There there's really nothing to to ease someone into that process. I don't know where I don't know how you even I don't know how you even start to fix that. I don't know. That's the thing. I do not know. I mean Portal didn't work because it watered down the rules. Yeah, I mean I was just and, gonna say like And then you learned a different version of the game than ultimately you'll end up playing later. Yeah. And that's just not thinking, a good thing. I was just thinking, like, if you, you could do, like, competitive package decks, but those aren't going to be playable by somebody who's just learning the game. I mean, I honestly feel like the best bet moving forward is MTG Arena, but then they're just going to play digitally. They're never going to play paper. Because, like, tutorials are easier to do in a computer game. It's standard yeah. is what Arena is likely to launch supporting. Right. Even though I'd really want to do like draft and things like that in, in MTG Arena, they're probably I mean, just going to launch with with standard as at first. It's probably going to launch with everything required to play using the standard legal sets. So I wouldn't be surprised if some draft and limited option show up as well. But don't expect like vintage or commander. Or... Right. Though I mean, commander has a lot of popularity. Um, I just saw that they're going to do a second print run of commander. 2017. I'm surprised the Dragon's deck and Vampire decks are gone. Yeah, well, all of, all of these, you know, $100 decks are going to plummet. I mean, the cat deck is still around. That That is a thing you could play. I have to actually like the cat deck a lot. I mean, I picked up all four, so, but it was, it was definitely noticeable which were the more popular ones, because, like, those were not available in the wild. One of these days, I'll have to try out my nonsense commander deck. <laughs> Commander is the, one of the few formats where you can buy a product and have an actually decent deck. And I guess that's what makes Commander as a, a more successful onboarding mechanism is that, yeah, like you, you buy a yeah. deck of a year and here you go. Now you can play. There's no equivalent of a starter box or a start collecting set. They yeah, they make starter decks, but they aren't very good. Well, they make like those intro decks or whatever. But they yeah, make dual no, they're, decks, yeah. They're, they're not good. They're not very good. Like they're, they'd be fine if they're you were playing against, against each other, right? If you were, if you're going to grab that and say, "Now I'm going to play with my friend with this deck that I don't normally play." I mean, I think it would work if if it were arranged in such a way that you could be like, "Hey, this is this is a good start," and then I could I can buy I can buy some stuff knowing that it will help me get a more like expand on what I already have, but. But like the whole booster pack thing kind of precludes that from being a possibility. Well, okay, so I don't know. Like, I feel like Pokemon does a better job at this because essentially any time a card becomes too expensive, they end up throwing it in one of those special collector's edition things as a different <laughs> art reprint so that it still becomes playable and in theory doesn't 
I, I mean, it affects the value of the original, but it doesn't massively affect the value of the original because it's different art. But also, they can reprint anything they want whenever they want. Yeah, Which reserve list. Do. Reserve list really, really hurts Magic long term viability. I think. I mean, I realize we're having this conversation when Kodra's not around, and he probably has very specific opinions on it. But I, I mean, do feel like yes. Wizards needs to do something. <laughs> to make it easier to bring people into that game? And the answer is not go to Friday Night Magic. My experience with Friday Night Magic was not that it was a good way to get into Magic. My my, my brief experience with Friday Night Magic is that it's a weird territorial environment and not really conducive to new people. It's a place you can kind of force yourself in into if you're very good. and But if you're not, then... Or if you're learning, like, it doesn't... Well, the equivalent is like trying to figure out how to play Call of Duty three months after release. <laughs> I think I just broke out in hives. But like, you're not going to have much learning time. You're just going to die a lot. Yeah, it. I, there's a thing that I've and I've had this conversation with Kodra. So the pity he's not here to hear it, but or contri- and and respond. But like, there's a thing that I've there's a thing that I've had where it is possible to learn. There is a there is a level of challenge where you are losing but still learning, and there's a point beyond that where you're just losing and you're not learning anything. Yeah, and just lo- and it's a thing that it's a thing that I'm really cognizant of in minis games because it's so it can be it can drive you away from the game really fast. So it's like, are you learning something or are you just losing? Well, I think the the example is. Like, do you know enough about your loss to be able to look up and figure out why you lost? Sometimes you're just losing because you're losing and you have no clue what they did or why they did. You're just going to lose. And at that point, there's no real material to that you can take from the experience to research how to do better in that scenario. There were so many situations happening at once that led yeah. to your downfall yeah. that you can't you know abstract it and understand what to do in the future yeah it's one of those things that i'm super cognizant of cognizant of when i'm trying to teach someone a game as well is like whether or not i win or lose i think it is usually better for you to win a game that you're learning but like some people are very very much not into that they'd like to they like to see the real they 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 like to see the real game even if it means that they get crushed and like okay and and i understand the like nobody likes to nobody likes somebody else to let them win um but there's also like you know if i open up an infinity game with the most hateful thing i can think of for somebody who's never played it like they're just gonna, there's going to be that, there's that's not fun to anybody out of curiosity what is the most hateful thing you could think of in infinity yeah um i don't know either either a list with like 18 orders and 12 to 15 camel markers or uh a list with a whole bunch of a whole bunch of smoke and visors that deny you decent reactions like anything that's either just something that keeps your your opponent from actually playing the game basically yeah or require some very specific counters that you're just not going to know um, I think that a, I think that a fide is a <laughs> a similar like. Well, you know, I can make you lose the game before you get to even go because you don't know what this does and you can't counter it and it you know handicaps you. That's what I was thinking. Of. You might you might suggest. But yeah, there's and there's a handful of stuff like that, and they all have counters. It's just a matter of you have to have some level of experience in the game to be able to answer those. It's like if somebody were to pull out a you know, Black Lotus Channel Fireball, Black Lotus Dark Ritual Channel Fireball deck. Or even somebody... more so, like some kind of a card denial deck would be horrible to play against the first time you play. Yep. Yeah. Well, I was, I was thinking with the Channel Fireball deck, it's like, okay, you just lost on turn one, and the question is, what could you have done? And it's like, well, there's no way to even glean anything from that. Though I do think that a card denial deck would be worse. Because with that, it's like, I had so many turns that I could have done something, but the answer was you really lost it like turn four. It just took you until turn nine to actually, for the game to actually be over. 
you just didn't know that you'd lost in, on turn four. Kind of a thing you see in, in StarCraft sometimes where, you know, somebody's like just starting their second base and their first base gets attacked and broken by an opponent and they think, well, I'm still kind of in this game. But no, and so no they, they're really not. Really but not. they're really not. Like, you know, they might get a force up, but by the time... And it's and the, there's a, that moment of super frustration where in the time it takes the opponent to actually find their new base and do something about it, all the while building their force, they're like, oh, hey, I've got, like, I'm I'm back on my feet. I've got, like, 10 Marines in a siege tank. And their opponent walks in with, like, 70 Stalkers and, you know, 40 Dark Templars and just a, a obscene amount of coverage. And they're like, wow, that just seemed impossible. It's like, well, because you actually lost that game 20 minutes ago. You just didn't know it. Well, I think you run into a problem with games like that, and you, you see it some in, you know, magic and, game, and that sort of thing too where you really can't learn to play the game well by playing the game you have to go spend time doing homework <laughs> i yeah. feel like warframe is that way for me <laughs> the amount of research that i need to do to really play that game and enjoy it was like more than i was willing to spend but i i think the biggest problem with like magic the gathering is you can't learn to play magic unless you already know someone that plays magic like in order to really learn that game you need to have someone that already knows the game and is willing to teach it to you and probably probably get you started with a deck right here here's a basic deck that is going to be viable yeah yeah because with something like magic you probably lost the game before you even started playing because you probably didn't build a good deck yeah and how do you, and how would you, yeah, it's like, how do you know if you just got a bad draw or if your deck is just garbage? How well, do you... and the other problem that I've noticed is like magic in their set building creates a lot of dead cardboard, like cards mm -hmm. that no one would ever play. Traps. That are There's just... so many cards that are just traps. Yeah, these I mean, are the... bad cards. Don't play them ever. They're, they're the, you know, pack draw equivalent of a zonk. I mean, they're just not something you ever want to get. Like, you're never going to do this. Sure, it may have cool artwork, but nobody's ever going to play this card. Whereas, I don't know, like, back I feel like in some the of revised those cards era... some do actually see play in Limited. Like, there are... In a draft? So, yeah, some cards are... There are... They do print still print some cards that are not good enough for a draft. And I'm really not sure why they do that. But they do print some cards that are only ever going to be good in draft because they are not very good, but they are common. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and and I feel like if you could, I feel like if you could reliably, I don't know, map, mapping it to miniatures games. Like when I play a miniatures game, one of the things that I'll do is I'll think about what are the basic things my list has to include to be a functional list? Like just simple, straightforward. If I... I can at least say that my I can at least walk into a game with my list knowing that I had the tools I needed to potentially win as long as I have these things. Whereas with Ma with a game like Magic, you're like, Aww. and part of that is because it's got such a huge variance. Well, and and this gets into the problem that I see with like <sighs> Kodra's answer of buy the cards you need for the deck. I mean, it, it, sure, that is absolutely the right answer, but unless you know what cards you actually need and know what strategy you're trying to build, especially for a game you've not really played much of, it is very daunting to invest any amount of money in a deck that you're unsure of. So instead, people net deck, and then that gets boring. It's a really difficult problem to solve. And I feel like, I feel like trying to solve that problem is how we got LCGs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But they have their own problems. They do have their own problem, which is if you come into an LCG late, <laughs> lol, uh, like you're going to be doing that same homework. And it's um, going to cost you a lot of money. And it's going to cost you a lot of money. Though, um, yeah, and, and I don't think LCGs are quite, there's not enough different people doing them, and they're not quite mature enough yet to have started to really address that problem. Although I think Netrunner did. I think I think Netrunner at one point Net was Runner like Netrunner sort of did by letting you do the physical version of net decking. They yeah. literally published tournament winner decks as yeah. products you can buy. Well, they I mean, did that. Magic they did used that. to do that too. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I, I thought Netrunner. 
at one point said like these are packs 2.0 they are designed to go with the original starter deck as a new season or tier but they are not compatible with the old set i was not enough internet runner to even be aware of that i'm i'm not either but it's the thing that i think i heard happen which i realize is like the worst kind of hearsay <laughs> so take it with a grain of salt but it, i think i i thought i remembered somebody at least talking about that happening i mean i i do kind of miss the magic of gathering uh pro tour world championship whatever decks that they used to have to where you could like buy individual decks that were an exact copy of someone that made it to the finals of the championships, but they were like sufficiently different to keep you from playing that in a tournament. They had like a silver border or something like that. I don't remember if silver or gold, but there was a, a visual difference in them so that they weren't tournament legal, but they were absolutely fine to go like play for fun. But anyway, uh, Thalen, I know a topic that you wanted to talk about, uh, I think last week, was Orwell. Yes. Uh, I ended up getting it, I think it was in Monthly Humble, Humble Bundle is how I ended up with it. Uh, but I'd kind of been looking at it anyway. And it is it is a very interesting and somewhat topical game. <laughs> so Orwell is one of those games where you're mostly watching npcs interacting and occasionally making a decision but it's mostly about you know watching the story unfold and at a couple of points causing it to branch in certain ways um but it's basically the the premise is in the very near future in the nation a political party has taken control and has created this system called Orwell because someone thought it would be funny. That's that's really within the game. You know, someone decided that that was the perfect name for this system um, because it's very Orwellian. But it's a massive surveillance system, basically tracking anything and everything about everyone. And to try and to try and set, have some ethical constraints to how it's used, it was set up so that there is an investigator, which is what you are, and then the person overseeing them. The investigator is responsible for going through all the information about people and plucking out what is useful and applicable and then sending it on to the overseer. The overseer only can only ever see the things that you send, send to them. They don't get to see any of the rest of it. Um, and you are presumably supposed to be unbiased about, you know, how you're going about things. Um, and then there's some other rules about that. You can only, you can only investigate people that there is some, you know, probable cause that they might be in, you know, involved in whatever it is you're looking into and so forth. But so this, it's, the game starts out with, there's a bombing and a woman was, seen on closed circuit camera at the the bombing site getting onto a bus who has a prior police record she was previously arrested um and it was related to a protest against the party in power and so of course she's a suspect and so you start investigating her and go from and it goes from there and it was a very interesting game they actually did a pretty good job of making the Orwell system not completely and obviously horrible and evil. Like, there are some aspects of you, you know, you can, if you do your job properly and follow the right clues and go on the right things, you know, prevent a future bombing from occurring. So, you know, you've, you've done something good. You've saved lives. Of course, you were, you know, going through people's emails and listening in on their conversations and all to do it. So, you know. <laughs> oh, so it, it kind of runs down that line of how much evil or how much good does it take to outweigh it, some evil? Yeah. I mean, to what point do the ends justify the means? And and there are points in the investigations where, you know, you, you know, like I said, the, you, the, the person overseeing you, who is the person that actually like sends this on to the police or decides what to be done with the information, they can only see what you send them. So one of the 
one of the um, things in the game is a lot of times you'll run into multiple bits of information that conflict with each other. And mostly it's not that it's not that one is one is correct and one is false. It's that they are two different people's viewpoints on the same thing. And you can only send one or the other on. Or even it's just, you know, two different, you know, two different statements by the same person. Like one was made two years ago and one was made two months ago. And, you know, two years ago on in a, you know, post made on a blog that was meant for mass consumption, they said that, you know, that they would never support violence against, you know, for, for any purpose. And then two months ago, when talking to a friend in a private text message in the heat of anger, because some very frustrating things had happened to them within the past 24 hours, you know, they said that the yeah would serve them right if they got blown up. So which one of those do you send? Do you send on, or do you just, or do you send neither? Because you can do that too. Huh. And which one you decide to send can have repercussions as to you know how things unfold. So is this a narrative experience, or is this more of a like manager style game? It's the entire game is through a. It's it's one of those games where game you are sitting in a computer and everything you're doing is interacting with a computer UI. It's all so along the lines of paper, pl papers, please, kind of thing. Similar to papers, please, without the um, without the uh, time limit element or the you know there, there's there's never a point there's never a point where you have to act quickly from a time standpoint. Um, the way they model that, the one place where there is a quote unquote time limit, is you have time to upload twenty things, and so you have to decide. Of all the information you come across, which are at which are worth sending sending on, yeah, and you know, and which things might might when you send them on might get you access to additional you know web pages or chat logs or whatever that might have useful information. Oh, I will have to I will have to check this out because that's fascinating. Yeah, it it was a very interesting game that I really enjoyed. They did a, they did a good job. Um, they did a good job with the NPCs, with basically the, the, the people that you're investigating them, making them feel like real people, and like slowly giving you bits and pieces of their backgrounds and, you know, causing you to, you know, maybe jump to a conclusion about a particular person and then find out more later later on about them. It maybe makes you rethink who they are and, you know, and the, their, their prior actions. There's also a sequel on the way that I think is supposed to be out for too much longer a a second season um ignorance or well ignorance is strength that will be focused on fake news you will be in the position of deciding what makes it into the nation's news media so that should be interesting yeah yikes so another topic that ended up not making it in last week was legend of five rings which is a living card game by fantasy flight man what it was a also made uh Netrunner and the Game of Thrones card game, which is sort of what Tim went when he said not a whole lot of people are doing this. Really, it's Fantasy Flight. It's, it's mostly yeah, Fantasy it's, Flight, it's yeah. Fantasy, yeah. Fantasy Flight. Like, basically picking up pre-existing licenses and transforming them into living card games. Because uh, L5R so, was, an art, was a pen and paper role-playing game. It was yeah. also a card game. Originally. Yeah. yeah. It was also collectible. And then it was a collectible card game. Yeah. Now it's a collectible card game again. Sort of. Sort of. I was familiar with the RPG and not the card game prior to Fantasy Flight picking it up. Yeah, I played a little of the, the RPG back in the day. It was pretty good. It's a neat setting. Yeah, the what I've seen of the setting is really neat. And like the the card game really sets up a um it sets up a world that I am kind of interested in seeing more of, which I think is cool. Like it accomplishes sort of that thing about card games where it gives you each card and and the way the thing that i feel like uh magic was really good at and is still mostly good at was kind of making every card a window into a larger world um and i feel like i don't know i have thoughts about where they are where they're at with that now but i get a lot of that feeling from both netrunner and uh the new l5r where it's like okay this feels like this really does feel like every card is a window into 
a a larger setting um and i think that some of the i think that some of the card art is really clever they do some they have some uh there's this sort of repetition of visuals that they use with su- su- sometimes subtle and sometimes not very subtle differences to sell a concept so like there's the pacifist faction and there's you know your more warlike faction and one of the one of the cards that the warlike faction l- likes is this it's this well lit shrine with katana on the uh like on a stand and like everything is in everything is in good repair and it's clean and it's pretty and like like i said well lit and then there's the pacifism card which is essentially that exact same scene except that it's like a dusty attic and there's spider webs between the swords and it it just they clever it's a yeah it's a cool little they, there's a bunch of cool little details like that um it has the most complicated combat i've ever seen that i like a lot now that i understand it but it definitely took some doing to understand how that structure worked because it's like the basics of it are that you had you have both you can initiate both a military or political conflicts and some cards may be able to enter one or the other based on how good they are at both of those things. Yeah, you're like you're like samurai noble is going to be good at both politics and sword play. But like your, your uh, raging berserker might not even be able to participate in a politics conflict. Yeah, and you're like court fashionista is going to be pretty garbage at and maybe not even be able to participate in a military conflict. But like unlike magic, where it's I attack you with this, it's I attack you in this way, under this sign, in this location, with these things. And, like, all of those are decision points. And, like, every every single one of those has a strategic element to it, which is cool. I think that's, I think it's really neat, but it is complicated. They kind of make up for that by having, they don't really have very much in the way of interrupt cards or a, or, like, the chain of instant casts that Magic is sort of famous for. They don't need a stack because you can't create a stack. Yeah. So as you've been talking, I my brain is is working on something. Um, wasn't L five R also the chosen setting for the D and D three point five Oriental Adventures? Yes. Set? Yes, it was. Okay, I thought so. That franchise has had really weird life. Yeah, it's Rook gone. Been around for a while. Yeah. But yeah, when basically when D and D three point came out, and they decided to make the D twenty system open and available to everybody, and so everything became D twenty. Rokugan L five R actually became was the official Oriental Adventures setting. Yeah, I don't have much to add other than that. I it was just bugging me, and I thought I remembered that, but <laughs> sometimes I don't remember things correctly. Yeah, because basically, was just the coast had gotten a hold of the L five R license by that point. So they I guess to use it. lost it now that, or no longer has it now that Fantasy Flight has it, apparently? I mean, yeah. They weren't doing anything with it. Yeah, I think basically they weren't doing anything. I, I don't know if they actually lost it, or if they just, like, gave Fantasy Flight like a good the, deal. the license for, you know, basically, because you know, Fantasy Flight has done a lot of licensing the ability to do games based on this and that and the other. I mean, they were doing all the Warhammer RPGs and board games and stuff until games, games workshop, workshop got cranky at them. themselves until games workshop decided that that uh, supposedly decided that fantasy flight was spending too much time on that star wars you know upstart <laughs> whether that's actually true or not but i mean fantasy flight is spending a lot of time on their star wars games and with good reason they're really good they're really good and they're really popular yeah games games workshop was salty about x-wing well X-Wing and Armada, Armada and... <laughs> Force and Destiny. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be really interested because Fantasy Flight has now said, okay, uh, since we're totally unshackled and we have the Star Wars license, we're going to do a Star Wars minis game. And I haven't played... I tend to like F- Fantasy Flight's games. They, t- they tend to do a pretty good job with, with their kind of longer-term stuff. Like, I think some of their, some of their one-and-done board games are a little hidden hit or miss depending but those have gotten better but they're I mean, like their star wars role-playing system is fantastic yeah the star wars role-playing system is fantastic 
Net, I love Netrunner. I've heard great things about the game. Like I've heard great things about all of their LCGs. Um, I'm I haven't heard anything about their other miniatures game. They're like Rune so Rune Wars. These so I guess Games Workshop isn't doing fantasy anymore. So I guess we'll pick it up. But like part of the reason I haven't looked into that is because they only have three factions and none of them appeal to me visually. Like just the aesthetic of the game doesn't do anything for me. It's funny because one of them is in fact elves. Yeah, it's wood elves though. Not the right sort of elves. Yeah, those, those are my sort of elves. Yeah. I mean, and they, they have, they look like very nice minis. Just not visually my thing. I'd probably look into it if they ever had one that I was into. I mean, I feel like dark elves and wood elves are the only kind of elves I care about. What about those magic using high elves? Fuck no. <laughs> high elves use less magic than dark elves. Generally speaking, this is true. I mean... I'm okay with Dark Elves using that corrupt kind of magic that does evil things. Just no, no, no High Elves. I'm going to remember that you have said that there are 40k factions that are too edgelordy for you, Bill. I mean, didn't you just remove a whole lot of skulls from something? Oh, yeah. No, look. I, yes. I've gone to great pains to remove skulls as adornment from, like, most of my stuff. It's surprisingly difficult. I say, I feel like I feel like you would have to do a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, I had to do a lot of that. Yes, I have I have an entire Space Marine army that has no skulls on it anywhere. That is very impressive. It's been it's been a an, a effort of will. You've got to work at it. I assume the Nurgle stuff came with skulls. Oh yeah, no, I didn't even bother trying <laughs> that one. Nope. That's I was awesome. like, whatever. Look, I don't think you get to. I don't think you get to wear skulls on your armor and try to call yourself the good guys. <laughs> like, there's a whole sketch about this. But they're fancy, shiny skulls. If they're beast skulls, I mean, that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, maybe. Space Marines don't really have beast skulls on their armor. Space maybe they do. should. Space Wolves. Hey, space Wolves do. I mean, they do. They even actually have a shot at calling themselves the good guys. Yeah. Just, you know, relatively speaking. I yeah. mean, I, I feel like... The Dark Angels and the Blood Angels are actually really Chaos Marines. They're they're right there on the edge. It does amuse me that the uh, the continuing meme on the 40k subreddit is traitor is Dark Elves are traitor Marines. So you'll see people that are like getting started with my Chaos Army, and it's a whole bunch of painted Dark Angels. <laughs> I mean, I kind of half expect, you know, with them actually advancing the plot, that they might actually fall to chaos. I mean, without the Dark Angels, who's going to be fighting the Tyranids on those Space Hulks? <laughs> like, I mean, you, you need that Deathwing. I don't remember what we were talking about just a moment ago. Nonsense. I mean, this started with L5R. <laughs> and it sort of degraded from there. <laughs> I mean, clearly we need to talk about clicker games, because I think that's the last thing on our list. Talk about what now? Clicker games. Oh right, S stupid browser clicker games. Because I, every so often, I'll be doing something that doesn't take enough of my attention, and I'll want something else that I could do that takes even less of my attention. And so I'll go find a clicker game. And there's there's some I guess fairly new ones that have shown up that kind of tell a story. In particular, there's there's one that came out relatively recently that's all about paper clips. Oh my god, pa paper! <laughs> I didn't think I I didn't think I would have anything to say about this one. My boss, <laughs> my boss found that paper clips game, and we spent like a solid hour talking about it recently. <laughs> it is it's it's a game where at the beginning of the game you you are a computer that is responsible for making paper clips. That will then be sold, and so you click a button to make a paperclip. Yep. You click another button. You click the button to make another paperclip. Doesn't and the doesn't it doesn't the price of the paperclips change based on you, some? You, well, you can set the price of the paperclips. Yeah, and okay. how quickly they sell will then is then based on the price of the paperclips and the demand for paperclips. And your only source of income is selling the paperclips, and you need money to buy wire to make into paper clips and to pay for improvements that will allow you to make more paper clicks make paper clips more quickly and the ultimate goal is to make more paper clips because you are a computer that makes paper clips all else is secondary so you know 
you can do things to increase the demand for paper clips, like marketing. And <laughs> you know, you can you can you can pay for marketing for your paper clips that increases the demand for paper clips, and then you can sell them faster or for more for money, more money. But mostly, you want to sell them cheaply and quickly because it's all about making more paper clips. And you can improve yourself once once the humans trust you enough. They will allow you to, you know, increase your RAM and your memory. And then you can spend time, you know, trying to come up with ways to make more paper clips or ways to make the humans trust you even more so that you can improve yourself more. So, you know, you can cure cancer because then the humans will trust you. <laughs> or find a solution for male pattern baldness. That's worth a lot of trust. What? And then eventually, once the humans trust you enough, you can release the hypno drones. I feel like we went off the rails somewhere, and I'm not sure where. <laughs> there are basically three separate stages of this game where, like, once you graduate from the first stage to the second stage, parts of the first stage just go away. Once you've released the Hypno Drones, money is no longer an issue. <laughs> <laughs> like, the only one of these games I've ever played is Cookie Clicker. It's, yeah, it's it's the same basic underlying game for all of them and it's just a question of how is it how is it skinned and what amusing messages do they put in the buttons make it really really weird spoilers the ultimate goal of the paperclips game is to turn the entire universe into paperclips or well, march for me this is how you win i mean that's no crazier than a universe <laughs> made out of pudding butterscotch pudding <laughs> Or the weird nigga granny thing going on in Cookie Clicker. Cookie Clicker, right? Like it's, I. It seems like it's, and I. I don't know if maybe Cookie Clicker is where this started, but it is necessary for clicker games these days for there to be some underlying weird creepy thing that you unveil eventually. So another one that because I, you know, I finished the paper close one because you can basically play through it in the course of a couple of hours. And yeah, it has a new game plus, but it's basically just you play the game again. So whatever. But there's another one called Succubox. And the premise of this one is the cool new game just came out. And so you buy it and you start playing it and gaining levels. And you can buy loot boxes. Oh, so, God. You, know, you spend $10 to buy a loot box and you open the loot box and maybe you get a hat or some XP or some gold or whatever. But then you don't have any more money. So you need to get a job. And you do work to get money to buy the loot boxes. And, you know, over time you get promotions and so on and so forth. But then eventually you decide, well, oh, I could start my own my own business and make more money to buy loot boxes. And it goes from there. And uh, at the point I'm at in the game, I have taken over the entire world. And I'm now exploring the universe, looking for aliens to force to become employees of my company to earn me more money so I can buy loot boxes. But yeah, it's just this weird genre of totally free browser-based games that just, you know, every so often you click a button and mostly they just do their own thing. It's actually kind of funny. I encountered, uh, there are also some not free examples on Steam that are generally much higher fidelity and I have no idea if they also take weird turns. <laughs> but like Magic Potion, Magic Potion Explorer is a game I encountered that is basically just a clicker. But I encountered it because its sequel is Magic Potion Destroyer, which takes that gameplay and then does some other weird stuff with it, and that just came out recently. Interesting. I feel like whenever I would normally play something like this, I end up playing Fall in London, <laughs> which is its own kind of diversion. But well, in fact, this is this is something that I have had like running in another window while I'm actively playing Kingdom of Loathing. <laughs> yeah, my <laughs> my my replay of Kingdom of Loathing didn't last very long. Aw. Mostly because I just got insanely busy at work. Yeah. Oh, I'm still happily giving Jick money each month for the item of the month. This month it was it was an exoskeleton. Not as in a exoskeleton that you wear. X-O skeleton. It's a little <laughs> skeleton familiar that gives you X's and O's every so often. And also oh. and kisses. That's, that's great. And you can have him hug your enemies. And then you'll steal something from them. I always love the item of the month concept because they were truly weird. Like all of them oh, yeah. are weird. Yeah, like I've got ones from back in the day. Like I've I've got a a Cheshire bat. It's just you know it's a bat that 
smiles, and sometimes it's invisible except for its smile, and the Nano Rhino, which came out in November during Nano Rhino. My problem with familiars is like the mosquito is just too damn good. No, well, until you find another familiar, until you get an item of the month familiar that gives you health and also does other stuff. Right, right. But like of the basic kinds of familiars, yeah, the mosquito is just OP. I feel like this has been one of those shows where we've been all over the place. Like, more so than usual. I think every week we uh, set a new bar for that. Yeah. So is there anything else we want to talk about before we kind of wrap things up? I mean, I realize I ask this all the time, and very rarely do you guys ever come up with a thing that we want to talk about, but... Every so often there's there's not a whole lot to talk about here, but Fire Fire Emblem Warriors is out, and it is definitely a more traditional Dynasty Warriors-style game than Hyrule Warriors was. I think it's still pretty good. It was pretty fun. I've heard really good things about it. Also, Mario Odyssey came out, and I've not touched it, but, I mean, I'm hearing decent things about it as well. Also, also, Wolfenstein the New Colossus came out. I haven't touched it yet. Also, I will be. Assassin's Creed came out. So I'm sure at some point in the future, we will all have things to say about all of these games. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, as far as Assassin's Creed games go, this one interests me a lot more than most of them, just because it's more open-worldy. Assassin's Creed is basically full-on action RPG. I'm okay with this. Interesting. Like, 100% okay with this. I also like the ancient Egyptian setting, so... So, uh, are we going to do the thing that we talked about before the show? <laughs> and throughout the yeah. day today? Yeah, we probably okay. should. Probably should. Okay, so we're, 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 we're switching things up a bit, because we've basically decided that we need more time with Divinity Original Sin 2. And we are also all playing destiny 2 right now so we are going to swap a what was going to be our games of the month and retroactively now destiny 2 <laughs> is our <laughs> our october game of the month and we will be moving divinity original sin to november so next week instead of talking about uh, divinity, divinity original sin 2 we will be talking about destiny 2 which is why we were fairly light on our details about Destiny 2 PC. Yep. It was never any different. It was always going to, it was always Destiny. And you just are you, remembering just wrong misheard. because it's D words. It's all D words. But anyway. Uh, We've hopefully... always been at war with another place. <laughs> East Asia. War. East Asia. War. War never changes. Anyway, um, hopefully you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next week for our Destiny 2 show. Good night! Good night. Good Good night. night.